so good evening. Uh, welcome to the Essex County Ornithological Club, uh, mostly monthly speaker series. I'm Constance Lapie, president of the COC. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are uh, going to have a brief ECOC meeting, should last about 15 minutes. If you're here to listen to Alan Poole talk about the marvelous recovery of Osprey over the last 50 years, while well, you're in the right place, uh, just sit tight and he'll get started at 7.45 right after this meeting. So uh, first up, some housekeeping. If you are having tech technological difficulties and you are on the Zoom call, go ahead and send a private message to Corey, uh, Corey Dodge. Uh, he can help you out. We are lucky to be supported by the technical whiz from the Peabody Essex Museum tonight. Uh, if you are having technical difficulties and you can't get on the chat, but you can still hear me, you can email Corey. Uh, it's Corey underscore Dodge at PEM.org. C-O-R-E-Y is his first name. So hopefully you're not having those troubles. Um, and uh, once we get started tonight with the speaker's presentation, if you could please just housekeeping, remember to mute your uh, computer so we don't have any interruptions, but until now you can interrupt me as much as you want. Um, and I see a message from Corey. Oh, Corey's put his email up there in the chat if you need to reach out to him. Thanks, Corey. Um, so we, uh, if you have some questions for the speaker tonight, we're gonna ask you to hold those until the end uh, and we can take people off mute and you can go ahead and ask the questions as opposed to putting them in the chat box. So I have some announcements. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, People are welcome. Sometimes it can be hard to remember those things at the end. So feel free to put them in the chat along the way if you want. Um, Alan's just going to take the questions at the end. That's all. OK, thanks for straightening that out, Jane. So I have some announcements. Uh, first off, um, I would like to, I guess, say out loud probably what most of us are thinking, which is, oh my gosh, the birds are doing it again, right? They're back. They're singing. They're letting us know it's the end of that really long, dreary period. There is light. I have never been so happy to see a couple of grackles fly into the yard. I am certainly looking forward to seeing that first osprey come back. Amen. Uh, so let's look ahead. Uh, the last event for our speaker series in this uh, winter spring season is going to be Friday, April 2nd. We're going to bring you Brian Pfeiffer. Uh, he is a uh, Vermont uh, field biologist and a writer, and he's going to talk about insects for birders. So I don't know about you, but I am really excited to be able to try to put some names on the other things that fly by my binoculars. So again, that's Friday. It's April 2nd. It's going to be at 745 right after the 730 ECOC meeting. It is a webinar. So keep an eye on your inbox uh, or check out our website for instructions on how to register. And then starting in May, we're gonna get live and get real. We're gonna head outside. Uh, those of you who have been watching our speaker series probably greatly enjoyed Jared Pies' talk on birding in Southeast Arizona. And we are very lucky that Jared is willing to host some bird walks in the Gloucester area this spring. Uh, there are going to be five bird walks, all of them from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. They're going to be in three locations. We have May 12th at Magnolia Woods. May 6th and 18th is going to be Dykes Pasture and Goose Cove Reservoir. And May 8th is going to be a dog town. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's instructions on how to register on our website. Uh, of course, masks, social distancing. Don't let that slow you down. Uh, so please check those out. Uh, also, the granddaddy of them all, the 115th Ipswich River uh, Canoe Survey is going to be Saturday, May 22nd, led by our very own Dave Brewster. Uh, this is a lovely, lovely tradition and a lovely paddle. So I hope you'll consider joining us. Uh, instructions how to contact Dave, those are also on our website. Does anyone else have uh, an announcement? 
go ahead and take yourself off mute if you do. So some of you, some of you may know there's been a, a conflict over parking at Andrews Point in Rockport, which is a long tradition as a sea watching place. Uh, many clubs go there. Um, kind of the heart of the issue is that a no parking sign was put up on town land in an area that there traditionally has been public parking and that birders have used. Uh, it's right by the footpath to Andrews Point. Uh, but that sign was put up without any other alternatives for parking nearby. Uh, there's parking in a public little lot on Linwood and Vine, but that's a couple blocks away. Uh, it's especially troubling for people with limited mobility. Um, so I've been kind of the point person on this issue. Uh, I've written letters for the ECOC, Brookline Bird Club, and the Massachusetts Association of Massachusetts Bird Clubs, which uh, includes 20 clubs from across the state. Uh, those were initially aimed at the uh, Rockport Right Away Committee. Uh, Constance and I both attended a meeting of that committee, uh, urging that there be public parking quite close and accessible to Andrews Point. So uh, that committee made a proposal that wasn't exactly what we were asking for, but I thought was satisfactory uh, and would allow some very close parking. Uh, we're kind of caught up in the bureaucracy of Rockport government, so the <coughs> That committee can't actually put up parking signs. So next step is to bring this to the uh, traffic and parking committee in Rockport. Um, I just sent out a letter today on behalf of the association. So that's uh, our goal is just to make sure birders have close uh, accessible parking and that, that footpath remain public access. The, this is kind of a long story, but the heart of the other side is one of butter, um, who has done a number of things that show she's trying to deny any public ask, access to um, Andrews Point, uh, either on a footpath that's on town land or the other side of her property. Uh, there's a public footpath on private property. So just uh, she was instrumental in getting that sign put up. She put up a, a COVID sign that tells people to keep walking. That looks like a legal sign or a city sign, but isn't. Uh, she's put up a legal notice trying to stake her claim. Uh, I got a report a couple of days ago that there are surveyors there. So she apparently is trying to claim that this is not town land, uh, but uh, her land. So birding community has definitely spoken up in force. I think we've done what we can do at, for the time being, um, but we have communicated to the traffic and parking committee that we feel it's important, um, not just for birders to have access, but any visitors and that the, you know, Rockport has a commitment to public access to Andrews Point and we want them to uphold that. That's it in a nutshell. I'd be glad to answer any questions if I can. Uh, just applause, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Yes, thank you, John, very much so. Um, so it looks like I've got a note in Robert Buxbaum uh, about the birders meeting starting on Sunday. Robert, did you want to uh, say a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, um, just at the Birders meeting, which is normally a, a big event held at a, usually at a college campus or something like that, it's gonna be all virtual this year. And the theme is gonna be birding your patch. And there are selected uh, times. Uh, the first one is Sunday evening. There's four lectures total, including um, Doug Tallamy is gonna be a speaker who spoke here. Um, Scott Edwards from the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, um, Heather Wolf and uh, Susanna Lerman are the speakers, but the theme is going to be, and it seems very appropriate for this time of COVID to be thinking about birding your patch. So just 
check the, for details on the Mass Audubon website for, for, the, for the times. Um, it looks like it's gonna be a really good program. Thank you, Robert. Not to put you on the spot, but do you think you could uh, put that link in the chat for everyone if they're interested? Sure, sure. I, could, I could do that, sure. That would be great, thank you. So I, I'd just like to say to Robert, nice background, Martin Heed painting of Newberry Marsh. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Excellent. I wasn't going to pass it off as my own painting, though. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, I see there's a note from Lynette Leica. Lynette, uh, maybe I messed up your last name there, but uh, did you want to say something about the uh, Plum Island competition? Oh. Uh, I can tell you that Lynette has written in the chat that uh, no, give, give it oh, there were 13 teams and 24 participants, 88 species reported, including several unanticipated species, wood duck, screech owl, and Wilson snipe. Uh, that's a report from the recent um, Blum Island, Plum Island sorry, uh, competition that they had to raise funds uh, to fund, I believe, an uh, internship. Uh, for uh, for young people to work uh, with the people at Plum Island. So good, I'm glad to hear that uh, you had some success there. So I think we'll move on from announcements. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Mary Stevens for the treasurer's report, Mary. Hello, I think I'm unmuted. Let me know if I'm not. Um, all right, cool. I can't see myself. Let me put myself on. It's not that I like to see me, I just have something to show you. It's you lovely. should get one of these for your car. You should definitely send me your annual dues, $12 per person, 15 per household. The lifetime membership is $200 if I'm not mistaken. Well, Looks good. if you are a new member, and you sign up tonight, you will get one of these nifty uh, car stickers for your window. I'm sounding like a telethon, I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> I've heard from a lot of you, thank you so much for sending dues. And for those of you who have not, um, this is a great deal. This is a wonderful club. Um, I couldn't say enough good things about it. So just, uh, yes, I will put my address into chat right now, my email address. And um, we can follow up that way. My information is also on the ECOC website. So renew or join, welcome. I would love to see you. Thank you so much, Mary. So I'd like to open this up again to see uh, what birds are you all seeing? What sightings do we have? I mentioned I was ecstatic to see a couple of grackles slip in under the radar this past week in my yard while I was working. What else are you guys seeing out there? Okay, I'll go. All right, uh, I've seen uh, wood ducks in Middleton at the uh, 114 line right between Danvers and Middleton. And um, I have not seen uh, American woodcocks uh, three times, um, including tonight, uh, not yet anyways, but I keep trying. Um, and I have a really weird bird visiting my backyard that's uh, possibly um, a hybrid dark-eyed junco, white-throated sparrow. It's pretty cool. Wow. I got pictures. I sent it to uh, David Larson. He doesn't know what it is. I sent it to Jeremiah Trimble. He doesn't know what it is. I, I sent it to Jan Smith. He didn't know what it was. He's, they all say it's a very interesting bird. It's got streaks on the flanks. And on the sides, it's uh, very brown on the head, has a little bit of a white stripe on the eyes, but otherwise kind of looks like a Junko. So I, I think it's a hybrid and um, I'm kind of excited about, it. I don't know, I like weird wacky birds like that. So that's it. That's crazy, Shiloh. Thank you so much for those reports. All right, anybody else got anything out there? Uh, I, have a I have a swan in the salt marsh behind my home in Beverly. You do, okay. Yeah. Hi, Constance. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can, Laura. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. 
So we had Woodcock's painting behind Salem High School on Wednesday, which was really nice. And this afternoon, uh, we had a barred owl right outside our living room window wow. in Salem, which was wow. amazing. That's fabulous. Thank yeah. you, Laura. Um, I see Donna Cooper also posted a pair of hooded mergansers in her stream. Mary Stevens is saying there's woodcock, Woodcock's back in Amherst. Um, I guess, Shiloh, we got you some intel. You can get out there and know where to find those Woodcocks now. Uh, anybody else got any cool sightings? Uh, Constance? Right. Yeah. It's Jim Barry. Jim Barry. The, yeah, hi. Uh, there's almost nothing <laughs> that I've seen in the way of spring migrants, but there's been a Barrow's Goldeneye, a female Barrow's Goldeneye in the Ipswich River downtown for all winter, along with a female common Goldeneye. And they're a little bit hard to tell apart, but you can do it if, if you try. And that's about the only rare bird I've seen around here. Jim, I'm glad you spoke up because I saw a peregrine on one of the um, churches on the top of the hill in Ipswich downtown. Last yeah, week that's the Methodist Church. Methodist that's right. Church. Yeah. Peregrine's yeah. there. Excellent. Thank you. Good to see you. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry whereabouts downtown Ipswich is that uh, Barrows? It, yeah, it's in the river. Um, and, and it, the boat landing the river, area? The river flows through downtown and it's below the dam. It's in the little cove by County Street where it leaves County Road. Uh, it's usually in that cove. So okay. that's, that, that's, you know what I mean? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Not too late to get that. Um, my, I, I won't call them my resident ravens, but they, I think they might be in Willowdale. Um, I can't remember which day it is now because I just don't remember any days now. But when it was really windy, I heard them vocalizing and I thought maybe crows were bothering them, but then I didn't hear any crows. And they were just doing barrel rolls and all sorts of things in the wind. It was just great. They well, are so yeah. fun. So, I saw a bald eagle in West Concord, and we have a whole slew of pileated woodpeckers. They seem to be the second most popular woodpecker in our area. Oh, it, woodpecker! Look. Wow. It's funny, uh, you know, they're all over everywhere. I don't know why. I've never seen that many. <clears throat> That's dramatic. How wonderful. Uh, I'm seeing that Carol's. Astoya has bald eagles and four pair of hooded merganser in the Sagas River, uh, three common red poles at the thistle feeder by Dave Young. Nancy Morgan had great horned owl vocalizing behind her house and two barred owls communicating. All right, it's busy. You guys have some great sightings out there. Um, keep up the good work. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed any of them, but um, it's, I, I'm just tickled pink that you guys are seeing such good birds. Um, I'd like to move on. If I can, Don Paul is going to present a book of the month. Hey there, Don. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, this month's book of the month is North with the Spring. I thought that would be good for May, for March. And it's by um, Edward, Edward Way, Edward, <laughs> Edwin Way Teal. Um, and this is the first in a series of four. Um, he and his wife and, and um, a person who's helped him write the books, um, her, her name is Nellie, uh, took four journeys around the United States through the four seasons. They went about 17,000 miles in all. Um, but this was the first one. And uh, it came about actually through a sad story because uh, he had a son, um, he and his wife had one child and only son and um, he died, uh, was killed in World War II in 1947. And they were distraught, um, grieving and decided just to um, take a long ride. And that was the, the genesis of these books. But they're now classics. There are several different editions out there. Um, probably get them at any library. You know, again, they're a well-known book. And um, this one's particularly nice to read during uh, early spring in New England to hear how it's done south of here. And uh, what the, the Teals did was just ride up from Florida, from the Everglades, 
uh, all the way up to the Canadian border in Maine. And so they had a springtime that lasted from, um, I think it was like January up until June. So for fans of spring, this is your book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Um, yeah, we're definitely feeling that spirit of renewal. So I appreciate that book tonight. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring you Janie Winchell. She's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Janie's the ECOC Program Director and the Director of the Art and Nature Center of the Peabody Essex Museum. Janie? Thanks, Constance, and great to be with all of you tonight. Uh, welcome to Ospreys, the revival of a global raptor with Alan Poole. And as Constance mentioned, this is a co-hosted event with Pam. I serve as the, um, the, the one who interweaves the two organizations. And so this is always a real treat for me to uh, introduce speakers. Alan Poole is joining us tonight from a research station in Costa Rica where he's been based February and March the past four winters. More about that in a minute. When Alan isn't in Costa Rica, he resides in South Dartmouth, Mass, where he studies osprey locally. There are 100 nesting pairs using platforms within two to three miles of his house. Alan is an associate of Cornell Lab, of Cornell Lab of Ornithology where he served as an editor uh, from 2003 to 2015. For the 22 years prior to joining Cornell, he was managing editor of the Birds of North America. The 18 volume set of 18,000 pages covering the complete life histories of North American birds, which you might be glad to know you can now access online at Cornell. Alan has been researching ospreys for 35 years and is considered one of the world's true authorities on the species. He published his first book about them back in 1989, Ospreys, A Natural and Unnatural History, but so much has been learned about them in subsequent years that he felt compelled to write a second book, which was published to great acclaim in 2019 and is the focus of tonight's talk. Though Alan continues to be enthralled with ospreys, he is also working on a new book about the resplendent Quetzal, hence the annual research trips to Costa Rica, or so he says. Hopefully we can get him back to tell us about his findings on these dazzling cloud forest birds of Central America. But tonight we've asked Alan to bring us up to date on ospreys as we anticipate their spring return to these parts. But before I turn the screen over to Alan, just a reminder to please mute, mute yourself and to feel free to add your questions to the chat box at the bottom of your screen, which he'll address at the end of this talk. Now, please join me in giving, me, giving Alan a warm virtual welcome. Thanks so much for joining us, Alan. Terrific, thank you, Janie. Wonderful to be here. Um, as we say in Costa Rica, uh, mucho gusto. Well, it's a, ple a pleasure to have see so many on board, and I'm delighted to be talking to you about ospreys this evening. And I'm also extend a warm invitation to come visit uh, here in the southern mountains of Costa Rica next uh, next winter. If you want to get your bird list a little more up to speed, I guarantee you, guarantee you, we can help. But if we're gonna talk about ospreys, what better place to start than with John James Audubon? He was really the first person to bring ospreys alive with, in both word and, and, and with paint. If you look at bird painting before Audubon, you realize um, that this man really broke the mold. Here we have from roughly 18, the 1830s, a painting that Audubon did as a young man in New Orleans when he was really just starting to hit his stride. And um, for me, it's always interesting to think about what um, Audubon knew. He knew a lot. He was able to write a lot about ospreys, but um, with the benefit of hindsight, we realize that uh, we're in a really good place now because we know so much more. And it's, it's, it's that more that I want to share with you 
uh, this evening. If we think about what makes osprey such a special bird, um, one of the seemingly obvious things is this is a hawk that catches fish. But when you step back to think about that a little bit, you realize that there are very few, really no other hawks that have that niche. No other hawk lives exclusively on live fish. A lot of them take fish occasionally. Some of them take fish quite a lot. Um, the bald eagle, of course, which isn't a hawk, but um, a, a near relative is an eagle, um, is known to take fish quite regularly, but it also stoops to taking garbage and um, uh, shoreline um, uh, dead fish that wash up on the shore, as well as chasing uh, ospreys and getting the poor ospreys to drop their fish. They are um, pirates of the first degree. You probably know the story about Ben Franklin, who was trying to, with his compatriots, was trying to decide what the national bird of the of the, the fledgling United States should be, and they were discussing it. Um, almost everybody wanted to have the bald eagle. Ben Franklin, of course, wanted the wild turkey because he thought it was a much smarter bird, and of course it is. But he also said that um, he thought the bald eagle was an inappropriate bird to be representing our great new nation because he said it was a bird of low moral character. I'm happy to say that ospreys are not birds of low moral character, and I'll be um, happy to share my reasons why I think that. For a fish eating bird, no, it, no, other, no other hawk is as well equipped as the, as the osprey. Here's the business end of the bird. Um, it is a combination of net and spear. Those claws that um, the, the, uh, the foot is remarkably large, the leg is long. Look how long those legs are. That's a bird that can reach deep underwater. Its, it's um, uh, entire foot is almost the size of a child's hand. Those claws are razor sharp and they close um, in, the, uh, in, the blink, in the blink of an eye. So this is a bird that is extraordinarily well equipped to um, not only to catch fish, but if you look carefully at the bottom of that foot, it's covered with a lot of really tiny little sharp spines and that helps them hold on to slippery fish. The geography of ospreys will start here in the, in the US um, because we really have um, most of the world's ospreys are found in, in, in North America, about two thirds. And You'll see the interesting thing here about ospreys, we think of them often as saltwater birds living along the Massachusetts coast. And of course they are here. They do most of their feeding in salt water. But if we move inland to say the Great Lakes or even to central Florida where they're um, often a freshwater bird all the way up through the boreal forests of Canada, even into Alaska, you find that a lot of ospreys through there are living entirely on freshwater lakes and, and rivers. So it's a remarkably adaptable bird. It's just as much at, uh, at home um, on, the, uh, on the, uh, the shores of the Florida Keys as it is uh, on, Great Slave and, uh, on, Great Bear, um, on Great Slave Lake. If we look for areas of concentration, Florida has about um, uh, 5,000 pairs of ospreys, big concentration there. All of you, many of you who have visited Florida, I, I'm sure you have seen and know those birds. Um, we also see them um, a lot in, uh, in, Ch in Chesapeake Bay as the largest concentration of nesting ospreys in the world. There are about 10,000 pairs. That's over 20% of the world population lives just in Chesapeake Bay. Of course, our, our parts of New England, especially, uh, uh, especially Southern New England, Massachusetts, Long Island, Connecticut, that area has, uh, we're up to um, almost 2,000 pairs in that area now. Similarly, coast of Maine and inland is doing really well with a couple of thousand pairs. Great Lakes, big concentrations there. The rest of the country, they're more spread out. But the point here is that we have a bird that can nest um, quite close together and uh, in, in concentrations, and that helps build up the numbers that we see here in the US and Canada. One of the things that um, is, is most conspicuous about ospreys, of course, is their huge stick nests. And it's a big investment. Think about it. There is a nest with probably 10,000 sticks in it. Each one of those sticks is a separate trip by the male osprey 
Here you see a very typical setup with a male off to the left on a, on a separate perch. He's there, but he's keeping a little distance, female on the, on the nest. Male does a fair amount of incubation um, and uh, about a third of it usually. And he'll also bring, of course, all the food once the young hatch. Um, his job is to supply the food for both the female and the young. As a matter of fact, all through incubation, he's bringing the food as well. So he's the provider and she's the one who really uh, tends, tends, the tends the nest and, uh, and uh, make sure all is in order there. Ospreys don't fight much, but one of the things that they do fight about are nests. Because it's such a big investment, if you have a nest, you can be, in, you can be sure of, um, uh, of being able to settle down and, um, and starting to uh, uh, have a clutch of eggs and, ra and raise young. Without a nest, um, you're, um, you're out of luck. You've got to go, you've got to find a place to go build one. You've got to take the time to build it, build it all up. It's a big, oftentimes a full year's investment before the birds are able to start actually using it for nesting. One of the amazing things about ospreys, and it's really been one of the, the keys to their success um, in, um, in, in the world that we've created here in the last 50 years is their ability to adapt to a whole variety, not only to the landscapes that we've created, the some, in some cases, highly urbanized landscapes, but also to the, to the constructions that we've put up that um, turn out to be ideal nest sites for the birds. Here you see an osprey nest in, in Mecklenburg in Germany. And uh, the Germans have uh, uh, done a tremendous job of building little wire baskets to keep the nests up away from the high tension lines, keep the birds safe. And this is just one of hundreds of such um, uh, um, adaptations that uh, the ospreys have taken to not only through Europe, but all through, all through the US. If you need any proof that ospreys are doing just fine in 21st century America, take a look at this slide. Here's an osprey nesting on the ground at Kennedy Airport in, uh, on the outskirts of New York City. There are several birds nesting here. They do, they raise young every year. The secret to their success, of course, is that Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge is just a mile or two away. So they have a good source of food and um, they have a nice open nesting area. They love open areas. They love being uh, up, up and either on the ground away from things or up in the tops of dead trees where they can get away from anything that might impede their flight. This is probably a familiar sight to many of you on the North Shore. Here we are in the Westport River estuaries where I live down in, in uh, Southeastern Mass. And these are typical of the nesting platforms that we have, have built. Um, we're gradually replacing them with ones that are a little, a little bit big, bigger and better. But the point, this particular nest has raised, has, has fledged young for the, for the last 15 years. The point is they can do amazingly well with very little. And I should point out, again, you probably don't need reminding, but uh, I think it's worth pointing out how important salt marshes have turned out to be for the ospreys that nest along our shore. These are absolutely perfect spots for bringing the birds out away from the shoreline. Our shorelines are getting increasingly crowded with, um, uh, with, with, with houses and uh, um, with, with busyness and Take them out of the marshes where people, people just don't go on salt marshes. Ospreys can spend entire weeks out there and never see a human being other than somebody going by in a boat and they're fine with that. So in some ways we found the perfect spot for them. We found, we found a way to fit them into the crush of our 21st century life in New England. And um, um, I think it's quite wonderful. I love salt marshes anyway and having ospreys on them only makes it uh, even better. Typical nest site here in Chesapeake Bay and actually out in the West Coast. This is uh, uh, a river in Oregon, uh, what uh, Columbia, I think. Um, ospreys love to nest over water. And so you, you, they, they take to these buoys and to channel markers. Chesapeake Bay with its 10,000 nests, um, at least half of those 5,000 nests are on either channel markers or, or buoys. So there they are nesting courtesy of the US Coast Guard and um, on, on fairly expensive contraptions. 
and the Coast Guard seems to put up with them. They have so far, and the Ospreys do just beautifully. High rise, high rent. In Florida, 5,000 pairs, 20% of them are nesting on cell towers. So here again, these are um, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of constru construction that have gone up all over America. It's as if, and little did these people know that they were building the super stimulus nesting site for an osprey. This is when ospreys go to sleep in, in the Amazon on their wintering grounds and they think of back home and they think of, gee, where can I find a nest? Where can I build a nest? This is what they dream about. This is as good as it gets for an osprey. You're about a hundred feet up. You're, you're away from everything. You've got good solid structure to put your nest on. Nobody's gonna bother you. Occasionally they get in the way of the, of the cell, the, the functioning of these cell towers and the nests have to be, be moved. But more often than not, 90% of the time they're just fine. So that's what kind of some of the things that makes Osprey special. Let's see how they've adapted to other, other parts of the world. Um, there are four subspecies of Ospreys, truly a global species. Really two main subspecies, a North American and a European. The North American, as we saw, nests from Alaska to all the way through to uh, Newfoundland and on down into Florida and into Baja for that matter on the West Coast. Wintering mostly through Central America, but primarily in South America, particularly the Eastern birds. In Europe, the same thing. They're going from Scotland to Japan with a, a few down into along the Mediterranean and even down into the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf. And those birds winter mostly in Africa, mostly in West Africa, with um, some of the easternmost nesters in um, Siberia, boreal forests coming down into India and uh, into Southeast Asia. And then there are two southern subspecies. There's the Cristata subspecies that nests along the coast of Australia and uh, New Guinea and nearby islands in the, in the uh, Southwest Pacific. Um, that's a non-migratory species and uh, subspecies and um, just an equally, uh, ca its counterpart in the Caribbean is the Ridgeway eye osprey, a fascinating bird that I've had the pleasure of doing some work on in Belize that nests in the Bahamas, Cuba, and Belize and a little bit of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's the, it's the least numerous osprey. That's a very small population. They're probably fewer than 500, uh, maybe a thousand pairs total. Um, but it's an interesting one and it seems to be fairly stable. A quick history of ospreys in uh, particularly in our area. Many of you I'm sure know this story, but I think it's worth reiterating because um, it's such, um, an, uh, such an encouraging one. The 1950s were a, a, a period where, um, where things were not encouraging, where um, uh, most of our coast was being sprayed repeatedly, mostly for mosquito control, both the forests and the marshes. You couldn't have figured out a better way to get pesticides into the bloodstream of ospreys than sending planes up and spraying the salt marshes of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, which is where most of the spraying was done. DDT was the big culprit, as I'm sure you know. Its problem was that it built up in food chains and um, ospreys at the top of the food chain were most vulnerable. People like Roger Torrey Peterson, who lived along the Connecticut River marshes in, uh, in Old Lyme, was one of the first to really see what was uh, going on. What DDT did, of course, was it killed the eggs. Um, it didn't really affect the adult birds that much. Other pesticides may have but mainly it just, it, it killed reproduction. So for years and years, the ospreys produced almost no young. Peterson was smart enough to notice that. He was keyed, keyed in on his birds, a good reason to have naturalists um, living in your area. And, uh, and he sounded the alarm. Other people were already starting to do that. Rachel Carson, most famously, um, she was uh, front and center, as I, again, I hardly need to tell you, in, in really leading the charge for waking people up to the fact that the pesticides we were using were having, were not targeting just the species that we were going after. They weren't just killing mosquitoes. They were killing a whole suite of other things and contaminating huge, huge swaths of our coast and, um, and, our, and our, particularly our waterways. She's a, she's a true hero. And when you think about it, um, when, um, when things broke, um, she really, um, uh, she, among other things, she testified before Congress 
and the government began to take notice and things happened quickly. And it was uh, a fascinating period politically and what was going on there in the late 60s, particularly the 70s. That, this was the era of most of the, most of the major environmental legis legislation that we're living with today in the US. Um, the EPA, the Endangered Species Act, um, the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, all of this came through um, under one might, one, one should note under Republican administrations, under that hippie environmentalist, Richard Nixon. And um, it didn't take long for most of that to get through. So there we go. That made a big difference for ospreys. And here you see um, just how big a difference it made. This is um, from the Mass Breeding Bird Atlas. Many of you are probably familiar with it on the top bar. You see where ospreys were in Massachusetts in 1975. There were just a tiny handful, fewer than 20 pairs in all of Massachusetts. And by um, 2010, the bottom, the bottom graph, the bottom bar, you can see there were all, almost up to 300 pairs. And that's ancient history now. In the last 10 years, we're up to almost actually over 500 pairs. And it's not just numbers. What's interesting is the geography, the distribution. Look how this has changed. Here, here's where ospreys were in um, basically the mid 70s, concentrated down in the Westport area, out on Martha's Vineyard, a tiny handful on Buzzards Bay, and uh, a tiny handful on Cape Cod and the Elizabeth Islands. This is what it looked like um, in uh, 2010. Look how the birds have spread. Cape Cod in particular has seen a huge surge in numbers. I lived, I came to Woods Hole as a grad student in um, the late 1970s, early 1980s. There were hardly any ospreys on, in fact, there were none other than a, a few around Falmouth on Cape Cod. Now there are almost, uh, I'm, I think over 200 pairs, close to 300 pairs on Cape Cod. Falmouth, Falmouth alone has 70 pairs of ospreys nesting. North Shore, I, I don't need to tell you, you've seen a huge proliferation there. Westport uh, and Dartmouth have 100 pairs. Martha's Vineyard has 100 pairs. The birds have found their way out to Nantucket where they're now um, 20, or 20 or 30 pairs. So it's not just numbers, it's big changes in distribution. Also a handful of inland pairs that you see there up into the, even up into the Berkshires. So they're spreading into fresh water as well. Fascinating to see the growth of this population. It's most carefully documented on the vineyard uh, and in Westport where we've been um, studying. I've been studying the Westport birds, Rob Beauregard, Gus Ben David and others have been looking at the, at the, the, the vineyard birds. Interesting parallels, exponential growth in the eighties and then a leveling off by the early, early to mid nineties. Those numbers have bumped up a little bit whereas as, a, as we mentioned that they're up to a hundred pairs now, but basically these birds hit a ceiling and that ceiling is both nest sites, mostly nest sites and perhaps a little bit food of food. When you start getting a hundred pairs, there's more interference, there's more competition, there's more fighting for nests. It's, it's harder for a new bird to come and settle into a population and to grow that population. One of the heartwarming parts of working with the Westport population has been the community involvement. You've probably seen it there too. Um, I know with, um, 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 Essex Greenbelt, they've uh, uh, brought, brought people in to help out on, the, on, the, on building these platforms. These platforms just work so beautifully and they're so rewarding. It's you know, like putting up a bluebird box and getting bluebirds the next, you know, the next month, they're there. Same thing with, I have put up osprey platforms on the Westport marshes with birds circling overhead. And before I got in my boat to go away, the birds are on the, on the platform. So they're hungry for these nesting sites. But above all, you can see how there's a new generation coming here. Kids are getting involved. Uh, it's quite wonderful. I can't mention Osprey nest sites and not mention um, a company that has formed um, out in the West Coast. It's called, uh, this is hard to believe. It's called Osprey Solutions LLC. And there's a guy that's putting his kids through college with putting out brush fires with Osprey nests all over the country. People call them up, find them on the web. And when ospreys are nesting on problem sites like this, you know, ballpark um, floodlights where they're, where they're shorting out the floodlights or they're on power poles, 
and uh, he's a pro at troubleshooting this and he'll either um, show up and do it and help you do it there or he'll uh, do it do it remotely but uh, I just thought you should know there's now a comp there is now an a company that is dealing with osprey nests in North America. So there you have it. They're back in our neighborhood. I don't need to tell you that. It's wonderful to really in my lifetime just seeing the um, the growth of our local ospreys has been nothing short of nothing short of phenomenal. Well, I want to move on to parts other parts of the world that I've found truly fascinating and doing research for my book, I was able to do some traveling in Europe. It made for a wonderful three weeks, a great excuse to be over there, meeting with colleagues and the people who are doing the same kind of work we're doing here in terms of monitoring ospreys and um, helping to, uh, to uh, build up their numbers through artificial nest sites and, 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 and other techniques. Um, when I, when I, usually when I give a talk in person, I. I say I will provide a free case of beer for anybody who can read and pronounce correctly any word on this sign and tell me what it means. I don't think I want to take that, that bet here because there are too many of you out there and one of you might actually be Finnish. But here we are, Finland. Um, Finland and um, adjacent Scandinavian countries, uh, Fennoscandian countries are the, <clears throat> are the heartland of ospreys in, in Europe. Again, far fewer numbers than we have here, far more dispersed nests. This is very typical of the nest sites that you find all through these boreal forests. It's a country that's a lot like Northern Canada. Um, you can see a nest there in the foreground. If you look closely, you'll see that it is, um, it's been, been, it's an artificial nest, it's been built up. We'll come back to that in a second. But here you have a quick look at European ospreys with um, the birds coming from all the way from Scotland, um, where they've uh, recently um, settled in in the last uh, 50 years. Um, France starting to come back a little bit in England, Germany, but most of the birds um, out of the uh, say six or 8,000 pairs, most of them are up here. Finland, particularly Sweden, Sweden has about 5,000 pairs and uh, Western, uh, the Western USSR. For me, this nothing says Finland better than this photo. It's probably mid-March, it's 38 degrees, it's just been raining for half a day. And this, this Finnish guy has got his red hat on and he's up at the top of the tree and he's building a nest for ospreys and he's gonna be doing it all spring long. And, and look at what these folks are doing. They don't mess around. They don't just put a platform up and hope that the ospreys will come in. They build the entire nest and they line it with the right kind of material. Here he is yelling, to, yelling down to somebody be, below him to send up, they've got a rope there. He's gonna, he's gonna pull up the material that they're gonna use to build in, these nests. There are over a thousand pairs of ospreys in Finland. At least half of them are nesting on, uh, on nests, like, uh, nests like this. Every single nest in Finland is monitored three times a year. They know precisely how many eggs are laid and how many young fledge out of the entire Finnish population. Finns don't mess around. This is what 10 p.m. looks like in Finland in the middle of the summer in July. And um, it is uh, reminds you that ospreys can hunt pretty much 24 hours a day, which probably helps them raise large broods, which they tend to do there. This is my good good buddy and colleague uh, Perti Sorla. He's a he's a, a Finnish ornithological legend. He's an osprey bander par excellence. I think he has banded over fifteen thousand um, ospreys. He's now seventy seven years old, still climbing trees. <laughs> here here he is. I photographed him with. I think this is his fifteen thousandth osprey that he's just that he's just banded. The secret to Perti's success, and for me, I think the success of everybody in Finland is that they, everybody has one of these. Three guesses and the first two don't count. This is a sauna. And when you go and visit people in Finland, almost everybody has a little country, tiny country cottage. And I visited Perti up in Osprey country where he, he, his cot, he and his wife's cottage was located on, on a lake. No electricity, no running water outhouse and a, and a sauna, um, and it was just absolute heaven. Just a reminder what baby ospreys look like around the world. 
Um, this is taken in Finland, but it could just as easily be uh, just as easily be at home. One of the things the Finns and actually other Europeans have done is they've used ospreys as a magnet to pull in tourists, and they've created these osprey centers. This one is part of an old trout hatchery. Um, and three guesses in the first two don't count why the Finns set up their osprey center at a trout hatchery. Why do you imagine? Well, because they can fill the pond with trout and then rent out these little photography blinds right here. People come from all over the world. When I was there, there were people from Japan, from, um, from Russia, and from the US who had literally flown in to spend a week photographing Osprey so that they could get shots like that. Um, I like to think of it as sitting ducks. I'm not sure it's entirely fair, but, uh, but there they are. They're getting amazing, amazing stuff. They're um, helping to support the uh, Osprey program in Finland and uh, everybody's happy. Jumping from Finland over to England and Scotland, the UK, um, we find a, um, a, a really an interesting parallel story with what we've seen here in the US. They've lost, um, um, Scotland and England lost 100% of their ospreys during the 1920s and 30s and 40s. They never had a lot. They may have had a few hundred pairs at the in, the in the early 1900s. But rather than pesticides in this part of the world, it was, um, it was persecution. These were birds that were shot that were trapped um, mostly by, in, in large estates, by gamekeepers. Ospreys are great at catching trout. The gamekeeper's job was to, to keep trout for large estates so that when the, um, when the sports came up from the city in their, in their Bentleys, they could uh, arrive and have plenty of trout to catch. And ospreys are easy to shoot. You find the nests and they're there. And gradually, one by one, they were able to pretty much wipe them out. The good news is that by the 1960s, attitudes were changing, laws were changing. It became <clears throat> much more um, um, a much bigger deal to shoot an osprey, and uh, uh, with great penalties. And the ospreys that did come at, in were seriously well protected. Land ownership and land use in Europe, and particularly in the UK, is fascinating. Very different than what we see here in the U.S. Most of the big holdings in Europe are privately owned. Most of the big holdings in the US are in public hands, national parks, um, national forests, Bureau of Land Management, um, Defense Department. Um, they own uh, somewhere between a third and a half of the land in the West. That's not the case in the UK. This particular house um, owns 100,000 acres, most of it forested. and. I don't know about you, but I don't know. I know, you know, I'm, um, <clears throat> I know a few people who have quite a bit of money, but I don't know anybody who owns 100,000 acres. Um, if you lived in England and you were a naturalist going around and checking osprey nests, you would know people who owned 100,000 acres because ospreys are, they're protecting the forests that ospreys are nesting on. Beautiful landscapes. Any of you who've been to Scotland know this only too well. This, this is a lock and arm of the sea that comes in. Um, perfect hunting grounds for ospreys, shallow, shallow water, um, lots of flounder and other fish. Um, they do very well here, but they also um, catch a lot of freshwater fish. Here again, we have an osprey center in Scotland, a famous one, probably the most famous one. This is Loch Garten, one of the first osprey nests that um, one of the first places that ospreys came to nest in, um, in Scotland in the 1960s. This nest was um, dutifully protected. 24 hours a day, they had guards on this nest. There are still, believe it or not, there are still egg collectors in Scotland and England, and ospreys were a prize, a prize part of any osprey, any, any egg collector's uh, collection. So they had to be very well protected. In a lot of cases, the, the, um, the uh, sites where ospreys were, nest, were, were nesting were kept um, totally under wraps. Nobody, nobody knew where they were except a handful of the, the monitors who were checking them. Two million, two million people have been to the Lock Garden Osprey Center. You can buy 
tea cups that have ospreys on them. You can buy tea towels with ospreys on them. You can buy lots of books, including, I'm pleased to say, mine here. And uh, mo most importantly, you can uh, look at a, a video monitor and through a telescope and watch the ospreys on their nest without, without bothering them. It's fascinating to me why this hasn't taken off um, in North America. We don't have any osprey centers. And um, I think it's partly because um, ospreys are um, just, a, ospreys are common enough here that they haven't quite taken on the cult status that they have uh, in Europe. And I think second of all, with the, um, with the, new, with the new webcams have taken the place um, of this. You no longer have to take a bus tour to go see an osprey nest. You can sit in your kitchen and have your morning coffee and watch an, an osprey nest with your, uh, through, the, through a webcam in many different parts of the country, as you, I'm sure you know. Quick look at um, how ospreys, again, this is, the, this is the story of ospreys in our era. 1975, they were just starting to come back to the UK. Um, by 2015, they were almost 300 pairs. They're well over 300 pairs now. This is the guy or one of the guys who's made it all happen. Um, Roy Dennis, great friend of mine, wonderful guy who has really been um, um, a, just a, um, a spark plug for this, for this work. He has been a tireless worker in bringing ospreys back to, uh, to um, many parts of Scotland, making sure the nests are secure, keeping them guarded and keeping um, uh, monitoring the nests uh, every year. From Scotland, ospreys have moved down to England. Uh, this is down to the Midlands, moved south into uh, the Midlands of, of, of England, where historically they were um, um, there in, um, in fairly good numbers, but never huge numbers. Here's a typical osprey nesting site in England, the edge of a, a, a big old oak and a hedgerow along the edge of a field. And most of these birds came, were brought down from, they were hacked out. They were brought down as young birds from Scotland fed artificially and then released as, as fledglings in this new area. So they imprinted on this new area to come back. It's a technique that's been used all over the world. And we'll talk more about it at the, at the end of this talk. Used a lot in the US, particularly in Midwestern states where um, ospreys were not, gonna, not likely to come back on their own. One particularly successful area here is a, um, is a, a huge uh, freshwater reservoir called Rutland Water. Um, again, an osprey center, um, a nature center has, has sprang up here. These are some of the young bird, hacked birds from Scotland that were brought down. They built these um, beautiful little, high, what they call hides, blinds, where the nests are monitored um, all um, 24, uh, you know, all, all daylight hours. And where you can go and there's a telescope set up and you can watch the nest. It's, it's, very, it's very British. It's just, everything is just done very nicely, very, very well done. The notes are perfectly kept and everybody's very excited about the ospreys there. They've also done a lot of work on migration as we have here, but I'm gonna focus on um, European migration because I, I think it's, um, it tells the same story and um, I, th I think you'll find it of interest. These are these little backpack satellite transmitters that um, osprey have been put on ospreys, over a hundred here in the US and um, an equal number in uh, both Scandinavia and, uh, and in Scotland. And these are able to give a GPS, uh, provide a GPS signal every, every few minutes. So you know how these ospreys are migrating and where they're going. It's, it's really kicked open the doors on osprey migration in a way that we never, never had, in the, giving us information we never, never had before. This is the kind of data that you get from these, um, from these transmitters, it's absolutely phenomenal. Here you have, this is unusual and I show it because it shows you a pair of ospreys, both the male and the female, a mated pair. And it's showing you a, a number of different things. First of all, that they are migrating um, using quite different routes. The female, keep in mind, leaves the nest much earlier than the male. The male raises the young through fledgling. The fledging, the female is gone just as the young are starting to fly, the male stays with them for another two or three weeks or a month. So she's building up her resources for these, um, for these long flights. 
Notice also how they're getting across the Mediterranean. Ospreys uh, will cross water, but if they can find a, a land bridge to do it, they will grab one. And here we see them using Sicily and Corsica and Sardinia to, um, to help them get across some large parts of uh, large parts of water, you know, large stretches of water. And um, most importantly, they're wintering in very different locations. They're wintering at least um, six or 800 miles apart. As my, as my um, buddy, Rob Beargard, who's done more work on osprey migration here in the US than, than anyone likes to joke. He said that um, it just shows that us, one of the reasons ospreys can stay mated for life is that they take separate winter vacations. This is what ospreys, those European ospreys, we were those Scandinavian ospreys, and really all European ospreys have to get across. The Sahara is a very tough crossing. It's a four or a five day crossing. And um, needless to say, there are not a lot of fish. So um, they, they are fasting, but ospreys build up a fair amount of fat before they take off. And it's that fat store that they're like so many other migrant birds. They're basically, the um, fat is their fuel tank. They're, li they're living on that. And um, it produces both food, uh, you know, both the energy they need and the water. Coming back to the Mediterranean and for our birds, the, Carib the Caribbean, which is their major barrier getting to South, getting to South America. There's a beautiful Julie Zikafus painting of an osprey crossing the Caribbean. It's anywhere from 24 to 30 hours, nonstop, flying day and night. Um, clouds or no clouds, storms or no clouds, these birds are doing it. It's quite extraordinary when you think about it. Um, there are at least uh, four, 30 to 20 to 30,000 ospreys that are going from North America, that are going across the Caribbean from mostly from Florida through Cuba, down into Hispaniola, and then jumping off from there. Back to Europe, this is um, um, where ospreys end up on the coast of Gambia, all the way from Mauritania and Senegal, around the coast into, um, into Gambia, and even, um, and even farther south from there. Here they, uh, they settle in. You see traditional fishermen here with wooden boats and small outboards that are using nets. Uh, and they've been, ospreys have been doing this for, you know, for millennia. What's changed recently is quite worrisome. The Chinese have discovered West Africa and they are buying their way into the waters along the coast here uh, with huge, huge um, trawlers that are taking more fish in, uh, in one day than an entire fleet of, um, of native fishermen will take in, 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 in and in an entire season. If you want some of the details on this, there's a very good article in the most recent New Yorker that talks about how um, the Chinese um, buy their way into these, um, into these situations. It's, uh, um, the governments tend to be corrupt. It's, 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 an, easy, it's, an, it's, it's an easy buy and, um, and people tend to look the other way. Theoretically, there's a seven mile limit here um, so that um, native fishermen can continue to get fish on the inside, but fish, um, fish move around a lot. So uh, you're not protecting the fish necessarily by making a seven mile limit. Plus at night, these, these, these uh, trawlers come in. Here's, here's, enough, uh, here's enough fish to feed probably 500 ospreys for uh, a month in, in one trawl from one of these, um, from one of these, from one of these boats. Interestingly, a lot of this fish is going into, is being processed on shore, producing a great deal of pollution doing that, which is the, what the New Yorker article talks about, um, but turned into fish meal. And that fish meal is going to Europe and America and, and Asia to feed farmed fish, mostly salmon. So here we're taking fish out of one part of the ocean feeding it, to turn it into, turn it into dry meal, shipping it um, across vast distances to feed fish in another part of the world that then get sold in, in our fish markets and the fish markets of Europe. It's a, it, it's a crazy world. 
Back to what ospreys have traditionally been, uh, been seen though, this would be a typical scene along the beaches of Senegal where hundreds, hundreds of ospreys winter, uh, spend every winter. Still a lot of people living traditional lives here. There are, um, here you see these donkey carts that are some of the main ways that um, trade goods are brought up and brought from the, from the mouths of the river where they're brought down from inland Senegal down to the coast where they can then be hauled, hauled along these beaches and taken to the towns and cities. Besides overfishing um, along our coast, one of the big worries for, for ospreys um, are fish farms. This is an inland, this is an inland fish farm, uh, happens to be in Ecuador, but it could be in, some, in so many different places. Um, and um, uh, they are, um, ospreys are very vulnerable here because these ponds are just packed with fish. And they're never gonna be able to resist flying over this and not stopping and picking up a, a fish, many fish. In fact, they, they will often just settle in and stay here. Why wouldn't they? In that little shack is surely somebody with a shotgun and hundreds, probably thousands of ospreys we know from work that's been done are shot every year on wintering grounds in Central, in Central and South America. And um, also in Europe, parts of Poland, there's a, Poland has a huge, um, uh, fish farm oper uh, operations and on migration, a lot of ospreys are shot going through there. One of the great things about ospreys, of course, is how they, how they link because of their long migrations, how they're linking different continents and different cultures. Here we see a, a, a classroom in Senegal um, that is being linked by computer with a classroom in Scotland. And they are learning about ospreys um, on their nesting grounds in Scotland, um, this uh, Senegalese class. Um, and in turn, the Scottish class is learning about what life is like in Senegal for an osprey spending its wintering there. So um, there you go. I mean, no, no other bird is quite as good at linking different continents as, um, as the osprey. They're such a, um, a bird that lives much of their life in the, in the open. And, um, and, and, peop and people know about them. A quick look at these hacking projects we talked about where the young are brought out of the nest maybe a couple of weeks before fledging. This happens to be in Spain, one of the areas that's had the uh, most success in, uh, in bringing ospreys back with these programs. These are young that are coming out of Sweden and out of Scotland. Um, they're fed artificially, they're um, uh, released and they take off uh, here on their own, but they continue to have food back at the, at the hacking tower. Here's somebody working um, all day long, <laughs> cutting up fish for the ospreys that are there and uh, tremendously successful programs. Hundreds of, um, of ospreys have been released in different parts of Europe to bring them back to Spain and parts of the Mediterranean where they had, uh, where they, the populations were either wiped out or were very low. And of course, in order to make sure when they return that they are kept in the area, a few nesting platforms is a, is a, is a great start. Well, there you have it. I think I've taken you a little over your time. I hope you don't mind. Um, I hope I've given you a, a glimpse of not just our ospreys, but ospreys in so many different parts of the world. It's Fascinating to me how much of the world this bird has been able to colonize, um, how well they were do, how well they are doing, um, how easily they are able to fit into the world that we've created with a little help from us along the way. They probably would do just fine even without us, but with us they do even better. As we look around um, in, in today's world at the at the um, uh, at how birds are doing, I don't need to tell you that there are lots of things to be worrying about. Birds are, uh, especially migratory birds, are having a tough time, a lot of them. So it's great when we have at least one species that uh, is doing as well um, as, osp as ospreys are. Um, it shows us that if we pay attention and, um, um, and work hard to to get the, the biggest threats out of the way that these birds can come back and, and grace us with their presence. So hats off to ospreys, hats off to you for building so many platforms along your coast. I hope you get out there in late March and early April and 
look for them coming back. And now you know a little bit more about where they've been, where they're coming from, and, and how they get back and forth. Thanks for interest. Thanks for listening. Um, any of you who have an interest in finding out more about uh, ospreys who want to follow up on some of this, here's my new book. Uh, my uh, email address is there in the lower right. Send me an email and I will be able to tell you how we can get, um, how I'll be able to send you signed and um, inscribed co uh, copies. They make great gifts, send them to your friends, send them to your family, great, store them up for Christmas. They're great Christmas presents. Um, and um, I'm, I've got plenty of books, so happy to help you out. Anyway, there it is. Thank you. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alan. That was wonderful. Uh, we do yes. have some questions piling up. Um, let's see. Uh, where in some, uh, Linda Haley wants to know, where was that center in Scotland? It, it's at Loch, a, 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 a place called Loch, a, a lake called Loch Garten. There's a, a, and that's in the highlands, in the highlands of Scotland. Um, it's in whiskey country, so you can combine an osprey tour with a whiskey tour if you want. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Lynette is asking, oh, which do you think are a greater threat to osprey nesting, bald eagles or great horned owls? Oh, I think great horned owls are, at this stage are, are doing, are taking a lot more ospreys than bald eagles are. Bald eagles tended tended to mo mostly just chase the ospreys for their for their food. I mean, they're taking young. The coast of Maine has gotten famous because there have been young snatched out of the, out of nests there. I think young at webcams, which is definitely a good way to advertise the bald eagle impacts. But uh, but horned owls are um, are doing um, um, who knows? You know, we don't really have good data on this. But my guess is that horned owls are having more of an impact than uh, than ospreys are. And then the bald eagles are. Neither of them, I mean, just look at those statistics on growth. Neither bald eagles or horned owls are making a dent in osprey populations. We've got more ospreys now. We, you know, ospreys are coming out, our, out the roof. We've got more ospreys than we know what to do with. And this is going to be, I mean, one of the real issues is what are we going to do 50 years from now? That's a good segue to a question by Rick Davis who asks, what has been the ecological impact of expanding populations? Oh, I think the impact is, I mean, the, the fish that they are feeding on primarily are in such, um, at least along our coast, are in such huge numbers that the osprey impacts are pretty, are pretty minimal. It's the nest sites that are gonna be more of a, an issue, more of a problem as, as ospreys um, start to really expand. Every ball field, uh, in the in New England is going to have an osprey nest on it. Um, lots of power poles are going to be um, the the electric companies, the power companies are going to be um, kept really, really, really busy. And um, it's a it's a bridge that we haven't really crossed, but we're we're getting to it. Yeah, and that actually leads well to a question here about um, any studies. Uh, from John Bitterman on the effects of high wattage radio waves, cell phone tower signals on birds, especially nesting ospreys. I don't think there are. Um, and um, ospreys seem to be doing, I mean, there are now 5,000 pairs of ospreys in Florida. So if the, if the, if the, if the way, if the, if the, if the, if the um, high power waves are having any impact on the young, it certainly isn't uh, um, preventing them from returning and becoming and becoming new breeders. I had a question personally, which is what is the closest you've ever seen to osprey nests or read about to osprey nests? You mean nests that are similar construction? How close together will they Oh, nest? how close together? Oh yes, sure. Um, they can be they can be very close together, and um, we have uh, Westport River is a perfect example. There we have what my friend uh, Rob Birgo calls the osprey ghetto, and we've got uh, we've got um, nests that are as close together as oh I don't know um, 30, 20 to 30 yards, twenty to thirty yards. Wow. 
So a half to a third of a third of a closer than that, a quarter of a, a football field. And is that um, Robert Buxbaum's asking if there are places where osprey are food limited? So um, with those densely uh, placed um, nests, are are you starting to see uh, situations where that's the the food really is the limiting factor? We're not because um, we're, at least we're not there. Um, nest density doesn't seem to in, influence uh, feeding ecology much at all. Keep in mind that these birds are commuting. They're not feeding around their nests. Mm -hmm. They're commuting three, four, five miles away. And they're changing feeding grounds all the time in response to fish migrations and where fish are. These are birds that are really reading the water. They're figuring out, they're so smart at figuring out where the fish are. And once they know where they are, they, they'll go right back there. So they have favored feeding grounds. When they dry up, they'll find, they'll start to, to, um, to, to find another area. Where we do see, where we do see feeding issues, it's not a nest, it's not a nest density issue, it's an ecosystem issue. So for instance, Florida Bay, um, ever, the Everglades going to, going to hell in a handbasket. Florida Bay is dry. The fish populations are way down in Florida Bay and ospreys are reflecting that. Hmm. There are um, huge, huge, uh, high, high rates of nest failure there, small brood sizes and dwindling populations. Whereas if you move over to the Keys or to Sanibel along the coast where you don't have the Everglades influence and you're back into open ocean, those birds tend to do much better. Hmm. Nancy Morgan is asking, uh, how deep can they dive? They can dive maybe half a meter deep. Again, we don't really know. They're a shallow water species. They prefer, prefer to get their, their fish in fairly shallow water or with surface schooling fish. They certainly can't go more than a meter deep. And it's probably more like half, maybe three quarters. And, um... Jeffrey Green was wondering, are they exclusively fishers? Is there any, has there been any studies that have shown them feeding on anything else, small, small ground mammals or? 99.98%. Hey, what's that 0.02%? 0.02%, there's an occasional squirrel. I'm not sure I really believe it, but. Um, Reportedly, probably, then probably, um, and there's um, a, there's a, a couple of cases in the Red Sea where they were taking, like seagulls, they were taking mollusks, hmm. um, large um, um, large snails. They were taking them up into the air and dropping them on rocky beaches and breaking and breaking them open. Again, wow. I find that hard to believe, but it was um, it was a, a, re a reliable report, so I'll I'll accept it. But you only you, they've got to be starving if they're taking anything else yeah they're really well adapted for fish and they're terribly adapted for anything else and, and alan i was wondering what ha, you know i know you're actively doing research now what is your focus with the population that's near you in south dartmouth yeah i mean i'm not to, to, to call it research is dressing it up a little bit. We're essentially monitoring, we're essentially monitoring populations, um, but we are keeping um, fairly good tabs on diet. I've had students who've spent a month at a time watching a, a handful of nests. One of the beauties of working in the Westport colony is that you can monitor four, they're so close together, you can monitor four or five nests at once. And so that's been a, um, a, a very interesting project over the years is following, um, getting good data on uh, what, fish are, what fish are coming in and how that changes seasonally. Most of all, we're looking at, um, at just at reproductive success. So we're able to monitor eggs, hatchlings, and fledglings. We get the three key periods of the, of the nesting season. And um, do you want to stop sharing and then that'll give us the, the field of people in case there's folks that would like to ask a question other than via chat? Sure. Is that is this good? Yeah, that's great. There is another question in chat coming in from Yeti Frankel. 
uh, which is, are there any efforts being made to work with fish farmers to find a way to protect their ponds from the migrating birds? <clears throat> yes, and I, I, I should have mentioned, that's a really good question. I should have mentioned that. There's been great work done by a couple of people um, out, out west and uh, at, at uh, Boise State in, in Idaho who have spent time in Colombia working with fish farmers. And in essence, the, the problem is that um, small scale, those mom and pop fish farms that you see, the people um, don't have enough money to buy the nets that are needed to cover their ponds. The big industri the larger industrial scale fish farms, um, they, are, um, they can afford nets and so they're able to net those ponds. And it's, by the way, it's not just ospreys, it's plenty of other birds too, uh, herons, egrets. Um, Believe it or not, even flycatchers, some of the big flycatchers, the myarchus flycatchers down here, take little tiny fish um, early uh, when, they're, when they're first being um, put out there. Kingfishers are shot re regularly at these fish farms. So yes, I mean, it's a great project for somebody and I could see your group getting, getting involved here. Um, it doesn't require much money to buy fish nets. It requires somebody who is um, adventurous, fluent in Spanish, and willing to go down and put in the time working with fish farmers down there. Sounds like a great project to get involved in. Yeah, Ecuador would be a good place to start. Any other questions from folks if you wanted to take your yourselves off mute and make a live question. Well, we had um, a great array of questions that came in from folks and uh, such a fascinating presentation, Alan. Uh, you covered a lot of ground, a lot of territory and, and there's such a remarkable species and, and, and hearing about their, um, some of the underlying aspects of their recovery and the people involved is, is a, a really great, um, it's a very uplifting experience. So thank J you. Janie, uh, yeah. I, was, I was gonna comment just on that point is that um, uh, it, it's it, it, for those of us old enough to have lived through the uh, decline and revival of the osprey. We forget that there are younger people among us who uh, don't know about that story. And it's great that Alan has retold it. And the, because the, um, you know, it's, it's not just um, uh, Rachel Carson and, and uh, so forth, but also, you know, Dennis Pulston and the founding of Environmental Defense Fund and all, all these things that uh, that, that happened in the 60s and early 70s to to uh, really help species recover. And it's an important story to be told because we can save things. And um, it, and it, it, it's it's great that Alan is, has has uh, uh, brought the story uh, back again and 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 told the this story of great uh, uh, species recovery success. Thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, for me, the fascinating thing is it's not just here, too. Mm. You go to you go to England, you go to Germany, you go to Spain. There's been a huge effort in the Mediterranean. I didn't really get into that, but there's been a huge effort to bring them back in the Mediterranean, which is a a, a, a population that was was quite threatened and, and very small, and um, they're gradually bringing that back. So the fact that people around the world are responding to this critter is um, is very, I find very heartening. And of course, there's good reason for it. They are, they are a species that respond well to us too. So um, it's, um, we're, 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 we've caught a break with this, with this bird particularly. And, yeah, and, who, um, who knows cell phone towers would be so popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think each cell phone, phone tower is somewhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars to build. So the, these ospreys are nesting on, on pretty expensive real estate. Um, and lots of people, which of course you won't have a chance necessarily to see this, Alan, but many comments thanking you uh, for a great presentation. And um, so uh, 
we really, really appreciate your joining us. Um, it's, it's, I guess we'll say it's one of the, um, the silver lining of COVID is that we wouldn't have been able to get you in March um, any other way than uh, the fact that we're getting you virtually. And so uh, that's been a, a real treat. You've my, made it very easy. My, my, my pleasure. And again, my, um, I, I reiterate, re reiterate my invitation. Surely you can find 12 people in your bird club to come down here next winter and see what Costa Rica has to offer in the way, in the way, of, in the way of birds. I'd be happy to consult. I can show you lots of different places you'd need, you'd need to go. Wow. That's a pretty incredible offer. Thank you. Hard to pass up. Yes, thank you so much. Could okay, you... well, I'm going to go get the rest of my dinner and um, I will um, hope to see you um, soon. Come, come visit in Westport. Good Could you put your, your address in the chat, the one where you can get the books from and also who, how to contact you if we want to take that trip? Oh, okay, well, you, I'm not going to run the trip. You're going to run the trip. I'm, I'm going oh, to go. I'm gonna advise. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not going to advise individually. I will, I will advise a, gr a, a group leader. So how do I do a chat here? We can put, so you um, wanted to put in your email that you had on. Yes, the, just can, my email is the best, is, is the way I would prefer to be contacted. Maybe Janie, could you do that? You have Yeah, that. I'm doing it right now. Terrific, thank you. And thank so, you. You're so welcome. Good presence. <laughs> okay. There we go. Got it? Got it. Yes. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alan. You enjoy the rest of your dinner. Be well. You as well. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. I'll see it. And Janie, we're going to wrap up a reminder for our next talk on uh, Friday, April 2nd. Don't forget Brian Pfeiffer coming down from Vermont to talk to us about insects for birders. Hope to see you there. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Good night. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night.